Hello everyone, uh, good afternoon and uh, good morning for who is uh, in the United States or good evening in, uh, in the Asian uh, continent. Welcome to the uh, short uh, uh, session, A4 for segmentation. Uh, we will uh, uh, start, uh, so the, the, the plan would be to have the papers grouped into uh, groups of three. So the, the speaker, the presenter will uh, uh, unmute themselves and they can uh, share the screen and uh, start with a very short presentation of their uh, work. Uh, it should last around 90 seconds, so a minute and a half. And at the uh, end of the presentation of the third speaker, we will uh, have a brief panel session uh, discussion about the three papers. And uh, I would like to, uh, I think, oh, I'll share it. Christian is uh, joining us very shortly. Right. Thank you for being here uh, with us. And uh, I would say uh, we could uh, start uh, our session with the first speaker, which is uh, Annika. Hi, uh, thank you for the introduction. Um, let me quickly share my screen. Um, so yeah, um, my name is Annika and our work is on common limitations of performance metrics and biomedical image analysis. And uh, as you probably know, every performance metric has its own specific strength and weaknesses. We already heard about it in the previous section. Um, and although many limitations are known, as you see in here, um, researchers are still um, asking for guidelines on how to choose the best metric for a specific problem. And this is why we are currently conducting a Delphi process for a, con a consensus decision on best practice recommendations for metrics in biomedical image analysis. By now, we are uh, 47 experts who are working on the problem and we're focusing on image level classification, object detection, and semantic and instance segmentation tasks. We will start um, by the driving biomedical question, so the problem that you actually want to tackle, and a task mapping as a flowchart will bring you to the correct image processing task. From this, we're currently working on a metric mapping. So um, uh, coming to the uh, concrete best practice recommendations for the most common problems in our domain. And this will be based on uh, the biomedical uh, driving question. So um, problem characteristics assigned to it and also mathematical relations between the metrics. And yeah, with this, I would like to end and uh, I'm happy to ask any questions. Thank you very much. I would uh, encourage the next uh, speaker to unmute and uh, start presenting. The next speaker uh, is uh, Ohang. Please, thank you. Hi. Okay. Can you see me? Yes, very well. Thank you. I will start to uh, share my uh, uh, presentation. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, okay. okay, so. Hello everyone, my name is Nguyen Kinh Hoang. Today I will present about our work at Bin Big Data Institute, Rift Chat Degrade, a benchmark dataset for automatic segmentation and labeling of individual rifts on Chat Degrade. So in this work, we introduce a new dataset, Rift Chat Degrade. To the best of our knowledge, it is the first dataset that contains uh, segmentation label for individual, both uh, uh, anterior and posterior rifts. And the data set contains 245 images and it has uh, 20 labels from right ribs 1 to right ribs 10 and left ribs 1 to left ribs 10 and uh, to uh, to develop a uh, segmentation algorithm we devised to 196 image for training and 49 image for evolution and we we uh, uh, 
deploy uh, this uh, set of four state of the yes models and uh, to emulate it, we using dice score 90 and 95% hard noise, uh, sensitivity, sensitivity, and you net level alert, which if it's net B0 is the best uh, model gets 83.4% dice score. And you can see the result. We uh, infer the models on uh, both internal and external uh, data, and it's work well on uh what get and also it's general it's uh it's a well in normal image and abnormal image thank you for the listening i'm happy to answer the question thank you very much uh, hello christian if you can please unmute uh, yourself into this okay hi everyone hi let me quickly share my screen. Okay, I hope you can see my screen. Uh, hi, my name is Christian Schiffer. I'm a PhD student at the Institute of Neuroscience and Medicine at Research Center Jülich. And I present our work on cutting angle prediction from histological human brain sections. This work was done in collaboration with Luisa Schumacher from Heinrich Heine University Düsseldorf, as well as Katrin Amons and Timo Dickschert from Research Center Jülich. In our lab, we, better, we aim to better understand the microstructural organization of the human brain. For this, we cut post-mortem human brains into histological slices and analyze structural patterns of the cortex using light microscopes. However, these structural patterns might not be visible if the angle between sectioning plane and tissue is too oblique. In this work, we explored how deep learning can be used to identify such obliquely cut regions with the goal to exclude them during subsequent analysis tasks. We trained a UNET model to predict the cutting angle for each pixel within the cortex given an image patch. To generate the required training data, we made use of the so-called big brain model, which is a high resolution 3D model of the human brain, which has been reconstructed from over 7,000 histological sections. The 3D context available for the big brain allowed us to compute cutting angles directly and use them as training data for our model. We evaluated the performance of the trained model in the big brain itself, as well as in another brain, and observed that the model successfully identifies obliquely cut regions. These encouraging results will enable us to specifically handle such regions in downstream analysis tasks to improve their reliability. I will be happy to discuss further details in the upcoming, upcoming discussion round. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Christian. Uh, I would uh, like now to invite uh, all the three speakers to um, activate their uh, microphone and uh, cameras, and we could uh, proceed with the uh, uh, discussion of panel discussion of this paper. Is there any question in the chat? Hello, Christian. Come on. So I could uh, we could go um, in order of presentation. So I have a, a first question for uh, Anika. Thank you very much for the presentation. It's a very interesting work. Uh, the question I have uh, is uh, uh, about if you have uh, any uh, recommendation um, for the others that, uh, for instance, with respect to multi-object segmentation problems. Um, so far, we don't have uh, the concrete recommendations. We are working on it. Um, uh, so uh, probably soon you will hear about it. Um, so one recommendation that we can give uh, independent from the task is to use multiple metrics um, that measure different properties. For example, uh, uh, going uh, using one overlap metrics like the dice and uh, another distance-based metric like uh, the house of distance or the surface dice and to avoid um, combining metrics that are uh, mathematically related. For example, the dice and the intersection over union because they matter, measure the same thing basically. Thank you. And on the same line, do you have uh, any um, suggestion of how interested researcher could contribute to the program? Um, well, we have an expert panel um, with many different experts from domains. If you're interested, feel free just to contact us. And we have another publication, which is a dynamic paper on archive. Um, in which we include different limitations in, in a graphical matter. Uh, so we're currently working on segmentation problems, but we're also uh, expanding to detection and classification. So if you have anything in mind that you don't find in the archive paper, 
um, just reach us. Uh, perhaps you have also already some drafts and things that you already see uh, every time when you see a paper and that it always annoys you. And we will also add you at a co-author. Yeah. Thank you very much. I think it's a wonderful initiative. Thank you for working on this. And let uh, We have some questions on the chat. Um, one question is to, to Anika, I guess. Um, what do you think about using non tricks like carbon footprint? That's a very good point, and I really like them um, as secondary metrics, and I think they can really add, really add value. It's depending on your application. If you want to do something in real time, then you need things like uh, compute time or also the carbon uh, footprint, which I really like. I, I saw the video. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We have a question for uh, uh, Juan, and uh, is about the data set. Uh, how does your data set uh, position with respect to the other data sets that are available already in the same domain. I think this was a very uh, interesting presentation and got a lot of good feedback in uh, the review process. And one of the questions was mostly related to the data set. So I think uh, the set, uh, I think the other uh, other set is the only one has uh, like uh, the label for individual lips, like we can. Uh, um, Differentiate the individuals, and also we had both uh, anterior and posterior ribs. Like uh, we had label for both uh, anterior and posterior ribs, so we can do uh, instant segmentation or multi label semantic segmentation instead of the uh, binary semantic segmentation. So, like that is a different. Okay. Thank you very much. So, we have a question for. Um... Let's see. Or uh, question by Antoine. Hi, Antoine. So the question is, how was the cutting angle determined in the training set? Um, yeah, so this is actually where the where the big brain data set that I mentioned um, comes into play. So the big brain is a 3D reconstructed um, brain, which was reconstructed from individual histological sections. And because we have the um, we have the three D context within this this um, unique data set, we can actually compute the cutting angle just by um, looking at. Um, so what what we do without going into too much detail is we compute compute a, a Laplacian field within the cortex and then take the gradients of these fields and compute and just compute for each of these gradient vectors um, the angle between um, between this vector. And the, and, the, and the normal vector of the cutting plane. So this is quite quite unique, uh, quite um, quite specific for the for this data set because we have a three D reconstruction. But uh, the nice thing is that with this um, deep learning model that was trained on uh, on this data set, we can transfer transfer to other brains which are not three D reconstructed. Um, and this is really nice because this three D reconstruction step is really really tedious and has. Uh, for now, only be done one time for this particular data set. Thank you uh, very much, Christian. I think uh, yeah. also your was a very great uh, presentation and work. Uh, for the, I think for the interest of time, we will have to jump to the next uh, group of three presenters, but I would like to invite uh, all the attendees to join the poster session at the end of this specific uh, panel discussion, where there will be further discussion uh, about the paper with uh, the others. Um, thank you very much, and I would uh, like to give a round of applause to all of you. The next speaker will be Marcus. Thank you. 
Marcus, we can't hear you, sorry. Can you hear me now? Yes, thank you. Uh, thanks a lot. We cannot hear you again. Yes. Uh, okay, thanks. Uh, in our work, we focus on data from neurosurgical interventions of brain tumors of um, in particular, video recordings um, from surgical microscopes. The data basically kept what uh, neurosurgeons see. Um, our work is motivated by an applicative need, uh, which is to identify salient imagery in neurosurgical microscopes. Um, here, our main assumption is that for neurosurgeons, surgical saliency is often given by the tips of the surgical instrument. Um, this is why we take the instrument tips as a proxy for surgical cells. Um, as we're interested in identifying saliency in, on the image region level, um, formulate instrument localization as predicting a core saliency map. Um, the goal uh, of our study uh, was a well-validated methodology. Um, this is why we include data from different neurosurgical subdisciplines, and we also record fandom data in order to see what happens um, under a purposely large domain shift. Um, in our methodology, we compare uh, saliency networks that take image data as input, networks that take motion data as input, for which we use optical flow. Um, we find that the image-based networks perform better on test data that is close to the training domain, while optical flow-based networks are more agnostic to domain shift. So based uh, on these observations, we fuse image and optical flow, and we find uh, that we can combine aforementioned properties uh, by two-stream fusion um, architecture. Um, thanks already now for the discussion. Thank you very much, Marcus. Next speaker will be Kian, please. Um, thank you. Uh, I'm sorry, maybe I cannot share my screen, um, but I can I can just introduce my work. Is that okay? Yes, please. Go ahead. Okay. Um, Oh, maybe I try another time. Uh, is it working now? Yes, we can see your screen now. Oh, thank you, thank you. Hi, I'm Qian, and I'm a PhD candidate at Shanghai Tech University in China. Our paper studies the problem of weakly supervised volumetric segmentation as you know, volumetric image segmentation is an important problem in medical image analysis, and weekly supervised learning helps a lot in reducing labeling cost. In our work, we tackle this problem from the perspective of 3D object shape. Our main idea consists of two aspects. One is to build a shape-aware segmentation model that, uh, and the other is to design a sparse annotation scheme. Specifically, our shape-aware segmentation model applies a self-taught shape prior to segmentation masks for shape denoising and outputs masks with clean and complete shape. Our sparse annotation scheme captures better shape context compared to existing weak labels such as scribble or box and provides sufficient information for training with less labeling cost. Empirical results show that our method can achieve the state-of-the-art performance on three benchmarks, including trachea, uh, left atrium, and prostate. Uh, 
this is the introduction of our work. I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. The next speaker will be Andre. Yes, hi, can you, can you hear me? Very well, thank you. Super. Um... Okay, so I should have my screen shared. So hi everyone, my name is Anjan LeMay and I'm affiliated with the NeuroPoly Lab from Polytechnic Montreal. Uh, medical images are often associated with some metadata such as information on the patient, on the disease or on the image acquisition process. Usually this information is discarded and not used for training. So in our work, we illustrate the benefits of including this information uh, into the deep learning pipeline, and we propose a flexible and efficient way uh, to integrate this information. So we adapt film, which is a general purpose conditioning method, but for image segmentation. So the key idea is to learn some uh, affine coefficient during the training uh, that are specific to the input metadata. And then we apply these affine coefficients to the feature map of the model to ultimately modify the uh, final prediction to hopefully improve the prediction. So our results uh, show uh, an improvement of 5.1% of dice score when inputting the tumor type in the context of spinal cord tumor segmentation. So for more application of this method, please refer to our paper. All our code is open source and I am happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much, Andren. So the three papers are uh, open for a panel discussion now again. So I will invite also Kian and uh, Marcus to turn on their camera and the microphone so we can. Uh... Do we have any question from the uh, attendees, uh, Christian? So we have a question for Marcus here. Um, so the question is, the focus was on localizing the instrument tip for real-time capability. Any comments on real-time performance? I'm sorry, can, can you repeat the question? Yes. The focus was on localizing the instrument mm -hmm. tip for real-time capability. Mm -hmm. Any comments on the real-time performance mm -hmm. of your system? So. Okay, so, um, so do you think that one one benefit of doing this core saliency prediction is um, that um, towards the idea of um, maybe that doing that in a, in a real time setting, this is quite advantageous since um, unlike in segmentation, you don't need to upsample. Thank you. I have a question on the same work for Marcus, if possible, which uh, it's related to the fact that uh, you are uh, predicting a very coarse location of the tip. Is there any uh, case in which this could be dangerous in uh, practical application if the tip is not actually uh, located correctly, let's say in uh, surgical navigation, for instance, could uh, collide with the tissues, something like that? Um, that is actually that's actually an interesting question. Um, so our assumption is that we want to know where's the saliency, and um, this is also the reason why we did not want to do semantic segmentation because we don't think that we need to be on a, on a pixel level. But of course, uh, the resolution of this core saliency um, um, is 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 always a question. How how much do you need there? Thank you. So we have a question to uh, Andrian on the chat. So the question is, did you consider more complex transformation than uh, affine transformations? Uh, it's a good question. Um, so currently we only tested with very simple uh, affine transformation and we already had a uh, good results. Uh, so we didn't try any more complex information, but since we are modifying all the feature maps, so we have multiple layers um 
so in the end, the modifications are still complex uh, for the final prediction. So quick answer, no, we didn't try anything else because we already had uh, some interesting results. But it would be interesting to maybe try other type of modifications, yeah. Thanks. I have a question for Kim, uh, and it's about the semantic segmentation network. If you could comment a little bit on the uh, labels, if they were pre-processed in order to support the supervision. I cannot hear you. Uh, Xian, you are muted. <laughs> Could you repeat the question? Yes, the question is if uh, there was some uh, pre-processing on the labels in the weak annotations in order to better uh, supervise the segmentation uh, yeah. when you treat yeah. the uh, semantic segmentation network. Uh, you mean the pre-processing, the standard pre-processing or the uh, our proposed the hybrid label? Uh, the standard processing, if you do oh. any processing on the actual, um, for instance, from the scribble. Oh, um, first of all, the scribble was uh, kind of uh, uh, generated from a principle that um, could cover both the foreground and the background uh, around the organ and is from basic uh, observation of the data. And the, uh, uh, the other standard uh, pre-processing uh, mainly are trying to uh, make sure the input image are as close uh, as possible to the organ, but uh, also cover the uh, uh, organs of the entire data set. It's built based on this principle and can be used as a general principle to uh, all kinds of data set. Is that clear? Yes. Thank and, you. Uh, I think that uh, in general, we can all follow up the, with this discussion if there is any question for all the speakers during the, the poster session that we follow this session. I'd like to thank the speaker. And we could uh, proceed with the third and the last group of this session. The first presenter will be Harsh. I think he might be here. Maybe we could start with the. Maybe we could start with the next one if. Uh, yes. Harsh is not here. Very good idea. We can start with uh, Kimberly, perhaps, for A eleven. Sure. Can you hear me well? Yes, we hear you very well. Okay. Um, is my screen good now? It, yes, we see it. Sweet, perfect. So I'm Kimberly Amador. I'm a PhD student at the University of Calgary in Canada, and our work is on acute ischemic stroke. So just a little bit of background. Acute ischemic stroke is a major cause of death and disability worldwide. And in order to determine the optimal treatment strategy, perfusion parameter maps are typically calculated from 4D CT perfusion data uh, to quantify two types of tissue, tissue that is at risk and the stroke lesion core. So a few deep learning models have been recently developed to predict the stroke lesion outcome from these pre-computed perfusion maps. However, Training a model in, on the raw 4D CT perfusion data and instead might be desirable as this information could contain a lot more valuable um, data that is simply not represented in perfusion maps. 
And therefore, we aim to develop and evaluate a novel temporal um, convolutional network, or TCN, that directly utilizes the raw 4 dctp data uh, to predict the stroke lesion outcome. So we use the multicenter data set and we performed two experiments. The first one to explore the impact of the time window size in the model performance. So just adding more or less time points. And then for comparison purposes, we also trained a CNN on perfusion maps. So the results show both qualitatively and quantitatively that the proposed model trained on more time points, so, so 32 time points, yield significant, significantly higher dice values than the rest of the trained models. And overall, we demonstrated that the proposed model can indeed extract spatial temporal information from the CTP scans for this task, for the stroke lesion outcome prediction, which interestingly led to significantly higher or just better results than using the standard perfusion maps that are used in clinical practice. And yeah, thanks for listening and I'm open to any questions. All right. So then the next speaker should be Philip, unless uh, Harsh is here. So Philip, you can start. All right. So you can you can hear and see me? Yes, we hear and see okay, you. Great. So yeah, hi, my name is Philip Grüning. I'm a PhD student at the University of Lübeck and a collaborator on a project that is called KI Zelle, where we investigate and analyze the movement of human cells. And well, here in the poster, you can see our processing pipeline. After we recorded specific cells, we extract the cell positions and combine them into cell tracks. And with these cell tracks, we can, for example, classify certain diseases. And to record the cells, we use a lens-free or we use lens-free holographic imaging, which means that we have a low-cost and lightweight device that can then simultaneously look at thousands of cells. And to extract the cell positions, we need cell segmentation. Now, based on the approach, raw recordings are first reconstructed, which is a very time-consuming process, and then segmented. However, our paper shows that we can circumvent this reconstruction process and learn the segmentation directly with convolutional neural networks. And we tested different architectures and learned that already a relatively small CNN, like the UNET with a ResNet-18 encoder, is feasible. In addition, using a ResNet-18 increases the segmentation speed by a factor of three. So interesting, interestingly, we found that the segmentation from the deep learning approach is more realistic, i.e. that cells detected by the CNN, but not by the baseline, behave and look like actual cells. And only with the CNN, we got results that had a constant cell number over time, which is the most realistic outcome. And furthermore, we used simulated data, and uh, with them, we could verify that the CNNs also yield a superior segmentation result compared to the baseline method. So thanks a lot, and uh, I'm open to questions. Thank you. So maybe one last chance for Arsh. Arsh, if you're here. No, we're okay. So I guess we can move on to the question period. Deb, Deb Dud, uh, is Deb Dud going to present A10? Yes, okay. Deb Dud, can you present now? Yep, uh, thank you. I was trying to figure out where to go, so I got a bit late. So uh, yeah, the work which we have is essentially what we call as digital DSM. The idea is, uh, can we use 2D processing within CNNs in order to extend it for processing out 3D volumes? And uh, it draws a very simple uh, uh, concept from uh, the concept of locality between neighboring frames. So in, in a typical scenario, what happens within 3D processing within CNNs is that you have all of your convolution kernels, which essentially operate in 3D space. So the kernels themselves become 4D, including the channels, and they work out. But that uh, additionally, uh, it increases uh, the complexity with an additional dimension. So here, our concept was something like this, that instead of trying to work out on retaining 
the channels particular to a certain slice, you can be sharing the channels across your slices. And by doing this, the option was that there can be some sort of a local information from a neighboring slice, either the previous one or the next slice, which can be carried over to the subsequent ones. And by way of mixing them, we did figure out that uh, if the CNN has enough amount of redundancy present within it, then this can impose some sort of a better regularization in terms of consistency in space. So that, uh, and, and this whole thing is again borrowed down from a very well-known concept within temporal shift modules in uh, using C 2D CNNs to analyze and segment out uh, uh, video frames. Now we just extended it over to 3D volumes uh, by just localizing, uh, by essentially sharing out the feature space over there. So there is uh, no restriction in terms of which particular features you need to share. You can randomly pick out at any given point of time uh, a fixed number of ones. So typically about 25% of the features are shared with the neighboring slices and there is no specific order in which the sharing needs to be done. The span of sharing these slices is uh, again uh, a custom direct, but we did find out that for most uh, of the work which we are doing on uh, segmenting in within CTs or MR volumes, we would try to keep the number of slices in the order of the thickness of most of the objects uh, which we would like to uh, uh, essentially segment out. So we did uh, run this one through a lot of different data sets, including BRATS, uh, then something for heart segmentation, hippocampus segmentation, as well as prostate segmentation. Now, when we compared our performance with uh, any traditional 3D, full 3D models, like say a 3D unit, then uh, we had a comparative performance. Whereas uh, a very critical thing is that uh, our method can achieve all of these performances at the level of a full 3D volume processing and the compute complexity of just a 2D CNN. So say that you have a volume which has about 400 uh, slices. Now, whatever would be the per voxel compute complexity. Sorry, if sorry, you are... to, sorry to interrupt. We're, we're running out of time. So maybe um, maybe we can just uh, go forward to the, the question session. And if people have yep. more uh one more want to have more information they can go see your paper or uh talk to you in the the poster session so we have about three minutes for questions you. um you. you can write it on the chat if you want or so i have a question for uh deep Duke. And it's uh, this. Could this approach be um, adapted also to different problems, which are not strictly, let's say, related to segmentation, for instance, image registration or any other? Group? Yeah. So any any of these problems where you can use a CNN which operates in two D, or you have an alternative one which operates in three D, you can essentially uh, extend the same concept. It's not restricted only to segmentation. We had tried it out on uh, regression problems and super resolution. But uh, just for the limit of space, we did not present out those results over here. Thank you. So we have a question for Kimberly. Um, the question is, um, so in, in a previous talk, it was mentioned that dice score is uh, not reliable for small structures. So do you have any comment on that? Yeah, they're definitely pretty sensitive, mostly to smaller targets. So that's one of the major problems. But die square is like one of the main metrics used for semantic segmentation of medical images. So that's why we decided to go for that. But as previously mentioned, like say house resistance or like we also um, measured absolute volume error. So all those metrics together would definitely be better for um, comparing, say, to other methods to like state of the art methods and stuff like that. But yeah, we, we definitely agree that there are or there should be better metrics for that. But it's yeah, it's it's what it is currently used in the literature. Thanks. Thank you. A question for. Um, sorry. Philip. <laughs> Thank you. And the, the question is, uh, I mean, I really like the sentence that the network likely performed better than the ground truth. So could you comment a little bit on that? 
So what we did is we used the baseline algorithm actually to um, compute uh, the the labels for our approach. So we didn't use any uh, labels labeling by hand because it would be quite tedious. And actually, so the baseline algorithm models the causality, so the physical process that is underlying in this uh, uh, in this modality or in this microscope. So it's something you could well use. However, um, yeah, the, the interesting thing is that um, if you compare the baseline segmentations with the CNN, um, the baseline or our CNNs uh, segment different cells. And if you look at those, well, they actually do all the same stuff uh, the other cells do. So they're the same speeds they they look the same and so this led us to the conclusion that uh, well the cnns somewhat are uh, maybe a bit more sensitive to other cells as well thank you so this is uh, so this is all the time we have so let's thank uh, all the speakers one more time for their great talks And just to remind you, there will be a virtual poster session following this. So you are uh, all invited to go there and uh, ask more questions to the speakers about their work. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank and you. enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you.